that your people are showing me right now, it belongs to you and it's rightfully yours. We surrender that this church is yours. This, we are your people. We are your children, we are your sons and daughters. You're our Father. And so even as we come together, Lord, to spend some time in just this space of discipleship, in this space of growing, in this space of equipping for the thing that is coming, Lord, we pray that you would just allow us to fix our eyes on Jesus. And as we do so, Lord, I'm praying that you will shift those things that need to be shifted. Remove those things that need to be removed. And put in those things that you yourself want. I thank you that we're living in a prophetic season. Living in a time of signs and wonders and miracles. And that, Lord, we will see them. We will see them. I thank you for everyone who's here. Everyone who's watching. And I pray that, Lord, the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart will be pleasing to you and building up to them. And that, Lord, you would edify and build up your people. For we pray this in Jesus' name and God's people say it together. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a big shout. Woo! Bless you, Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. It's so, so good to see every one of you. And what an amazing time to be alive. I'm so glad to see every single one. I can see some empty seats, by the way. We need to fill these seats, huh? So if you're friends in your discipleship group, people who just need to be here, make sure they come. I mean, this is going to be... It's, it's, it's different being here than watching this on video, isn't it? Even though there are people who are watching, uh, going to watch this later, even the ones who are watch, having a watch party, just being with others has a way of building our faith. And so I'm so excited that we get to listen to God's Word together as a family. And again, just to say thank you, Pastor Kilonzi, for that amazing Word. Uh, I think... I think conversations uh, going forward. I really do feel it was the word that God wanted us to hear uh, for this season. You know, it's interesting because I want to talk today about why we need fathers. Why we need fathers. I don't know. I mean, it's just like I was listening to Pastor Kilo and I was like, dude, I should have preached before you. You said all, my, all the nice things I was going to say. But I, I don't think it's a coincidence. I really do think that the Lord wanted you to sort of set the tone. And right now, already several miracles have happened. Uh, just met a daughter I haven't met in many, many years. And it was such a joyful reunion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God is, God is bringing some amazing things. And I believe it's going to happen across this movement. Yeah, you have people who've been estranged from you who are going to come back to you. Uh, every word that God gives me, I know is a word for you. So if my sons and daughters are coming back, then you're going to have people coming back to you uh, and calling you. We live in a world that has greatly questioned the role of fathers. More often than not, fathers are painted as the bad guys in our society. Everybody loves Mother's Day. <laughs> We're never quite sure what to do with Father's Day. It's just, it's just a thing you do because we have to do some affirmative action, you know. And, and society, when it talks about dads, typically 90% of the articles will use words like deadbeat dads, absent fathers, baby daddies, father wounds, fill in the blanks. I mean, there's just things that we say when we think about fathers. And many times it, it rings true because this is an experience that many of us have had with fathers. In a reaction against patriarchy, and the oppression of women traditionally, society has swung to the other extreme with a message that anything that men do, women can do better. And who needs men? Sometimes people even ask, why do we even need men? Women bring up children better. They are present. Men are even absent most of the time. And many people who've had negative experiences with fathers, when they hear these messages, they ring true, this whole concept of fatherhood, both physically and spiritually, and that's a problem. When we have a problem with fathers physically, we tend to have the problem with our father spiritually. Those two things are very intertwined, and I don't know why God allowed them to be so close together. And that's why I believe that as God's people, we must understand the crucial place that the father play plays in our lives. And I want to point you to the same words that Pastor Kilonzi read. They're the last words of the Old Testament. It's the last two verses of the Old Testament. It's interesting because the, the book of Malachi, it's, 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 it's a book that many times, it sums up the whole message of the Old Testament. 
If you read the book of Malachi, it's summing up that message. And it's basically telling God's people that you can't do it by yourselves. And so the, the challenge of the, 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 the prophet Malachi to God's people is, as much as you're trying, you're still messing up. These are people who've been to exile. They've sinned. They went to exile. They stayed 70 years. They came back with uh, Nehemiah and Ezra. They rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. They started again, but they're still messing up. And there's just something wrong that needs a divine solution. That's actually the message of the Old Testament. That you know what? You can have everything working perfectly, but it needs a divine solution. There's no way humans can ever take themselves to God, no matter how much they try. And so the, this book of Malachi, he talks about how faithless they've been. They've been faithless to their wives. They've been faithful to the covenant. They've been faithless to the covenant. They've been faithless to, to tithing. They've been faithless to all the things that God has told them. But in the last two verses, Malachi talks about the solution that God has for them. And it's a very interesting solution because I'm sure the people at that time did not understand that solution. Because Malachi says in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 to 6, this is what the prophet Malachi says. He says, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And he says, he will turn the hearts of their parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. Let's read that together. Or else... I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Now, it's very interesting because, uh, as Pastor Kilonzi told us, that's not necessarily the accurate understanding of that word. It's very easy to think, okay, God is like issuing a threat. But as he told us, the world is already under a curse. And basically what God is saying is, I will not find a solution. I will remove the solution to the curse. Because fathers, their work is to lift curses. Fathers, their work is to bless. And so he says, you know what? If, if the hearts of fathers are not reconciled to sons, and the hearts of sons are not reconciled to fathers, and remember here we're talking about Israel. So it's not men and women, uh, men alone. It's talking about the men and women of Israel. So I think we can replace mothers in that sentence and replace daughters in that sentence. He says, if these hearts are not, the generational healing does not happen, then he says the curse will continue to operate. The curse will continue to operate. God is not the author of evil. God is not the one who is uh, issuing a threat. But he's saying that there's a curse that is going on, and it will continue to operate. You know, it's very interesting. Pastor Kilonzi told us about the curse and how it operates. The world has something that we learned in physics. It's called the law of entropy. I'm giving some people cold sweats. They're like, which one was that? Which one was that? Because <laughs> the last time you remember it, you had crumbed it for an exam. That's the last time you remember. The law of entropy basically means things will always get worse than where they are. If you buy a house, a beautiful house, furnish it with a beautiful furniture, and then lock it up and go away and come back after a year, you will not find it looking better. It will actually look worse. Nobody will have broken into that house, but your furniture will be in a worse shape. As, in fact, it's better if someone was sitting on it. Just by staying like that, things will already have been happening to it. The fact that nobody was living in that house, things will already, it will have already been deteriorating. But things naturally deteriorate unless somebody does something to stop it. Look at your neighbor. Aren't they looking amazing? Yeah. This morning, they had to do something about entropy. <laughs> That's why they're looking so amazing. If you just got out of bed and showed up here the way you looked, <laughs> what a shock. Some of us might have run away thinking we've seen a ghost, you know. There's, you have to do something to stop things from deteriorating. You have to exercise to make your... Don't you wish you could just sleep and eat chips and then you get a six-pack? That would be so nice. But that's not how the world works. You have to exercise. If, yeah, you, <laughs> you have to. You have to put in some energy for it to look better. It doesn't get better by itself. Nothing gets better by itself. If you have a marriage relationship and you just let it go on cruise mode and don't put in effort, you put all the effort in your job, you put all the effort in your education, you put all the effort in your career, but you neglect your marriage, guess what's going to happen? Your marriage will break apart. 
It doesn't matter how anointed it was. It doesn't matter how many pastors have prayed over you. It doesn't matter how, who did your wedding ceremony. Your marriage will break. You have to put effort into things for them to succeed. This is how the world is. There's a condemnation that is already there. That's why thieves steal. That's why murderers murder. That's why abusers abuse. That's not how God created the world. But there's a curse that is operating in the world today. And it's interesting because John 3, verse 17 to 18, it tells us, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Because whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. If you don't believe, it's not like God is going to say, I curse you because you don't believe. It's like, if you don't believe, you're cursed already. You're already condemned. The condemnation is there. It's a natural state. So the natural state is not that you're good and then things happen. The natural state is that you are under a curse. You're born under a curse. Something has to happen to lift the curse. Something has to happen to lift the curse from our lives. And that's why the hearts of fathers must be turned towards their children and the hearts of children must be turned towards their fathers because fathers lift the curse wow. and they bring the blessing somebody say i'm understanding, understanding. this this is this is it's such a pro, it's such a profound thing to understand that god has somehow allowed fathers to lift the curse and release the blessing i don't know how it works i don't comprehend the physics behind it or the science behind it but god of heaven works through fathers to lift the curse and to release the blessing. So and you start, li you start living a blessed life when you bec become aligned to your father. It's a, it's a very magical thing. We've discovered it in our team. You just start to align. I discovered it in my own life. I began to align with Bishop Oscar. And I just went back to him. I said, you're my father. It was not a concept he was familiar with in his, in his, in his own background. And I think at first he was very, what's just happened to this guy? <laughs> But I, I was like, no, it's not about you. I honor my father. You are my father. Wow. And I you remember what Pastor Kelonzi said? Sons call out fathers. Yeah. Sons are the ones who call out fathers. And so I went and honored him. And things started changing in my life in rapid succession. Wow. And until today, I'm not even sure how. Like, you just look at it and you're like, how did that even happen? Something just began to shift. Ease and acceleration. That's one of the words God has given us this year. Ease and acceleration. So as we're talking about this thing, just understand, these are some of the keys to ease and acceleration. Because as Pastor Kelonzi says, inheritance means that you don't work, you don't work for an inheritance. An inheritance is yours by right. It just comes when you engage. The son, the prodigal son, that inheritance was his by right. But he actually walked away from it. You can walk away from your inheritance. You can live a cursed life. He was living with pigs. Spiritually, to be with pigs in the Jewish culture was the most despised thing. It was worse than being a murderer. It was just, you're far. You're the farthest thing from God's grace you can ever be. And this man had an inheritance that was still active, but he was not benefiting from that inheritance. And that's exactly what happens when you don't understand the role of a father. And that's why God says the hearts of fathers must be turned to children and the hearts of children must be turned to the hearts of the fathers. It's a heart thing. It's a connection thing. You know, you can be home, the light's on, but nobody's home. Have you ever heard that? Like, like you can be there, but you're not there. And that's why Pastor Kilo said there were two prodigal sons. This is a story about the son who returned, but it's also about the son who... <laughs> never... <laughs> I don't even know. He, he, he had left, but he was there. His heart was not with the father. He didn't share the father's concern. He didn't share the father's love. He was that firstborn that Pastor Angie was warning us about. Who says, how, how dare you accept that guy? He doesn't belong to our family. He's the one who was telling the father what the father should feel. Because he didn't share the father's heart. So this, it's a, I call it the story of two prodigal sons. And there's a son in the house who is still a prodigal. You can be in the house doing everything. And again, Pastor, Pastor Clons, you preached my sermon. I mean, that's exactly what... <laughs> what Pastor Nyamo was. She was the prodigal in the house. Perfect in your job description. Smiling. The father is sure that he has a son. But that son is not a son. 
until the son comes back and says, you are my father. Wasn't that demonstrated beautifully? Thank you so much, Pastor Nyamu. That was amazing. I just thought, you preached my sermon for me. You preached my sermon for me. I love that. Now, it's very interesting that if you've had negative experiences with father, some of this, is, some of this might rub you the wrong way. But I'm doing this for your advantage. I'm teaching for your advantage. This is for you. Amen. This is for you. This is the best thing you could ever hear today. Now, the, after Malachi, you flip the page and you get to what? Matthew. It's like the Old Testament ends and flip the page and boom, you get into Matthew. And you know, if you don't know the history, you'll, you'll assume it's the next day. Something new happens. But actually, scholars tell us there are 400 years between that last chapter of Malachi and the first chapter of Matthew. 400 years when the Lord doesn't speak. The Lord says to these people, the hearts of sons must be turned to the hearts of their fathers. The hearts of fathers must be turned to the hearts of sons or else this curse will continue. And then he goes silent for 400 years. And in those 400 years, it's like the people of God are just in that space where God is not speaking. They are not hearing his voice. They don't understand what's happening. They are waiting eagerly for God to solve this problem. And God has a solution. And so you start the book of Matthew and the solution hits you in the face. After 400 years, God has something to say. And this is what God says. Have you ever noticed the book of Matthew starts this way? Can you, do you have Matthew chapter 1 verse 1? I thought these guys had some notes from me. There you go. All right. Let's go. Let's read it together. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the servant, the, the employee, the colleague. What does it say? The son of David, the son of Abraham. The first line in the New Testament starts with sonship. It starts with sonship. It's like, here's, here's a problem, guys. Here's a problem. These hearts must be put together. And then 400 years later, God starts with a solution. Wow. It's about sonship. Did you ever know the New Testament, the new covenant, the most important thing, God's message for a dying world, it starts with sonship. It starts with sonship. But here's the crazy thing about this sonship. In this sonship, God himself is the son. Do you think about that? The Son. Who is, that? Who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is God. He's incarnate God. God comes down to earth as a son. As a son. And as a son of who? I mean, it's, 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 it's one thing for us to think of God as our Father and we as the Son. But in this case, God is the son of a human being. God created Abraham. When Abraham was walking, God had made him. God conceived him. He thought about him. He put him in place. The ancient of days had been there long before Abraham was. Jesus himself said, before Abraham was, I am. Not I was. Because you understand, in heaven there's no time. Time is a construct that God created. Past present, future. God doesn't exist there. Before Abraham was, I am. In other words, I'm still there. I still understand what's going on there. And I, he says, I, he's the one who was and who is and is to come. That's just a human way of describing God because God is timeless. He's not bound. There's no yesterday, today, or tomorrow for God because he exists. He has always existed. He always will. And he, the one who says, before Abraham was, I am, says, I am now the son of this Abraham. Wow. Isn't that amazing? He puts aside his I amness and he enters into a human being. And he calls himself the son of David, the man who slept with Bathsheba, the man who killed Bathsheba's husband. He says, I am the son of that one. What is God trying to show us here? What is this radical demonstration of sonship? God is so intent that we get it, that he himself becomes a son. Wow. Wow. And he puts himself in that place so that we can understand that we all need fathers because God works through fathers to lift the curse and release the blessing. And God is demonstrating this powerfully for us. You know, when you're too proud to be a son or daughter, you're, you're separating yourself from the world of the blessed. 
because you're working under the curse. And it may look like you're doing well. The prodigal son thought he was doing well. He took the inheritance. But did you notice that inheritance did not help him? Because he still ended up with the pigs. So you don't separate yourself from fathers. And when I look back, all the good things that have ever happened to me in my ministry are because of fathers. Everything good. By the way, I'm the least original person you know. In fact, at one point, I used to really feel bad about it. I'd be like, God, give me an original idea. Something that I can define and say, this one came from Moravi, nothing else. It was purely original work. What a shock. <laughs> Everything I've ever taught you came from someone else. Everything. There's nothing original under the sun. I've never met anybody original, by the way. Everybody came from somewhere. You can't be your own father. <laughs> when I met Pastor Oscar, it was such an amazing thing. Pastor Carol can tell you, we were his interns. Like, everything I learned about parenting, I learned from Pastor Oscar. And the way I parented my kids, who they've turned out to be, I really credit to my spiritual father. He's the one who taught me these things. Uh, like, he really, really, it's just being there. Who I am in ministry today is because of fathers. I followed different people over the years. And some, at some point, I was not even aware of the language, the terminology. I might not have said this was sonship. This was following. But it was still working because I was following. I was posturing myself and following. Fathers play multiple roles in a family. Fathers, they conceive. They bring life. That's what a father does. You know, if you are the person who, who gives life to a business, you're the father of that business. Without you, that idea would not have come into being. Fathers conceive. It's because of the father that you exist. Fathers protect. Pastor Kelonzi talked about that. They give cover. Uh, it's very interesting because uh, we talked about, we we're just talking about this, having a conversation with our pastors yesterday about fathers. And, and it's interesting for the families that have been in a place where you lost a father. And some of you have been in that place. And the experience many people say it's like, it's like something was removed. We didn't even know that that thing was there. Like just one day, we were quite there, not asking questions. I loved how, how Pastor Kelonzi put it. Like we're in that space where, you know, school fees is being paid. We don't even know the name of the landlord. <laughs> when, 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 uh, when our dad, um, my wife's dad, passed, that's the first time we realized how vulnerable we can become as a family. We realized we had relatives. We didn't know who had ambitions we didn't have over land that was not theirs. And all of a sudden, a very confident mom is in a place where you're vulnerable. And you're thinking, my goodness, we never even knew such things existed in the family. Now we are praying about things we had no idea. It's like the storm starts to beat you and you're wondering, where did this come from? Because a cover had been lifted. And we never knew because the, the, the man carried that mantle of protection over his family. And this is what do fathers just protect. They cover. Fathers provide. They work to provide. Fathers challenge. I love the fact that fathers challenge. Have you ever seen fathers playing with children? They play differently from moms. <laughs> Mothers are usually, their hearts are in their mouth. They're like, stop, don't touch my baby. Because <laughs> the dad, dads kind of like do things like, whoo, and the kid is like, ah. <laughs> and the mother's like, don't do that to my child. But you know, the child needs that. Yeah, because the child needs to learn to take risks. They need to learn to be creative and to jump. They need to learn not to cower because moms are like, no, no, protect my baby. Don't eat soil. The father is like, but that's how will they strengthen their immune system? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a diff How will they grow? If, how will they? Yeah. It's interesting. One of our friends was telling us how he, he, he was punched when he was in school and how his dad told him, now, when they punch you next time, let me show you how you punch back. That's... Like, only a dad does that. <laughs> Mom's like, who, who did you tell? Have you called the teacher? Teach, which, what's the number of that teacher? It's a, let, let's go to the principal. How is he letting people punch my little boy? That's why you need fathers, because the cowboy will always be running looking for a principal in life. The father needs to teach him, you also fold your fist like this, and you punch. <laughs> fathers and force. Fathers enforce. You can tell families where fathers have not done their job because there's no sense of enforcement. There's a way that fathers enforce. 
When fathers do their job, they don't have to shout. Yeah. They're just very silent. One look and the rules are kept. When you see the mother struggling to enforce, it's because the father has failed to do their role. Because fathers enforce, that's their role. Fathers launch. Fathers launch. It's interesting when children are very comfortable in the house. And they're past the stage of leaving the house. It's because the father did not enforce, or there was no father to enforce. Because fathers are the ones who start saying, hey, this house has become too small. Uh, we need to find a place. And the mom is like, oh, but the house is there, their room is there. The father is like, no, it's not their room, it's my room. I also have visitors who can use that room. <laughs> <laughs> many of you have younger children. You've not had this conversation, but my wife and I have had it many times. No, no, I have to host people. I can't be seeing my house. I have pastors coming from other countries. So it's time for the children to go and find a room, a place of their own. And mom's like, but they're so young. No, no, no. How will they ever learn? Yeah, I know. Your father will do that to you. <laughs> this was a baby that was crying. Um, <laughs> Fathers, bless. And this is the most important role. Fathers, bless. There's a way that fathers, that God cooperates with the blessings of fathers. And I still don't understand it. When you look at Jacob, an old man standing on his stick, and he blesses Pharaoh, who is the most powerful ruler of the world. If you've ever read that scripture, he blessed Pharaoh. And guess what happened? The world order changed shortly after that. And Pharaoh ended up being not just the most powerful ruler of the world of his time, but now he owned the whole of Egypt and all the people of Egypt just because a man spoke a blessing. If you read, he spoke blessings over each of his sons. And those blessings became tribal blessings and they became generational blessings. Like God cooperated. Like you don't even get the sense that he was praying to hear what to say. He uttered blessings. And the Holy Spirit just cooperates with the blessing and those things become established. The only difference between Jacob, that same man, and his brother Esau was the father's blessing. That's the only difference. In fact, it was not money because when Jacob left home, who was left with all the money? It was Esau. Esau had lots of stuff because he was left with his father's wealth. But Jacob knew he didn't need the wealth. He needed the blessing. Yeah. It's a blessing he was after. He was a very smart man. And he took the blessing and after that, it was well with him. Until today, his descendants are still being blessed. Because a father spoke a word. So fathers bless. These are the intangible things that fathers do. And you know what? Fathers model who God is. I, think, I really think that's why God puts them as a representative. They model to us the fatherhood of God. Because without fathers, we don't understand who God is as a father. We don't understand the fatherhood of God. Now, it's interesting that experts have found that children with fathers who are involved in their health and development may grow into teens who are less at risk of depression, of behavioral problems, of teenage pregnancy. And this is, this is only to say that in a situation when you don't have a physical father in the house, all is not lost because you can build uncles and you can call in other fathers, people in your discipleship group to speak as fathers into the life of that child. But there is a role that God gives to fathers. I believe that mothers have an incredible role in our family as well, by the way. When I teach about fathers, I'm not in any way diminishing the role of mothers because mothers have an incredibly crucial role. But I also wanted to talk about the role of fathers today, that fathers have an amazing role that they play as well. Now, in different stages of your life, you're going to need different fathers. I love how Pastor Kilonze demonstrated that. I'm truly grateful for Reverend James Wanchao, my biological father. Uh, he is an incredible man of God. Um, he has modeled for me and my brother and our siblings uh, just what it means to be a person of character. Uh, it's interesting because we've strayed from the faith in different places, but one of the things that I know about my siblings is that they're people of character. I mean, when my bro, even when he wasn't a Christian, this guy is a man of character. Like, there are some things, those who know Mutahi will know, there are some things that this guy doesn't take. If he finds injustice, he will fight against it. That's, that's my dad. That's who my dad is. We just gained that from him. 
And I know that he's, he's one of the most secure people I've ever met. Like if you meet Reverend Manjao, he doesn't, even if you say something about him that's harsh, he just smiles. They're just, he just smiles. He just has a way of just dispelling energy. And people love him for that. He's very self-secure. Very self-secure. Um, I've had people criticize him. I've had, even my mom say something once in a while that is just like, you know, dad, you, your dad should have done this. He just has a way he just smiles it off. <laughs> and he just moves, he, he changes the subject and he moves on. In fact, sometimes you think he hasn't had. <laughs> You're like, huh? But he heard you very clearly. I've, I've noticed he has a thing. He has a way that he just, he just moves on. And you know what? One of the things about us and about me, I know this about myself, I've seen it in my siblings as well, we're pretty self-secure. I'm pretty secure in who I am. People will say things about me. I hear them. I don't ignore them, but I don't take them home with me. And my wife can tell you, we've had conversations where people have said all manner of things. I've told her, I've ranted at it, closed it, and gone to sleep and slept like a baby. And the next morning I woke up and I was fine. But I don't take that for granted. That's an inheritance. Wow. I got that because of that biological father. I love the fact that I got that. If not for Bishop Oscar Moreau, I would never have got the desire to be a pastor. I would not be standing here in front of you. Uh, he's, my dad's a pastor, but I didn't get that from him. I got it from my spiritual father. And he's the one who taught us. Uh, my father in ministry, he taught, he taught us so many things. He became more than a father in ministry because he's the one who taught us how to bring up children. He's the one who taught me how to be married to my wife. Uh, he taught me so much about who I am today. People say I speak like him. A long time people would say when they hear me speaking, they hear him speak. That was the best compliment anyone could ever give me. I found myself in places that were open for me just because, I was, because he said, by the way, this one, he's a good man. And people listened. It's interesting how fathers open doors. He just said, this one's a good man. I think he could do that. And, so, and I'd get those international invitations simply because I was related to him. And I found doors opening that would never have opened if not for him. I would never have known if not for Pastor Rick Warren and Bill Hybels. I would never have known what it is to plant a church for people who don't like church. When we started Mavuno, people thought we were very radical, very revolutionary. Who does that? Who starts a church where they change music around and they do all these radical things? You know, it must be a cult. What they didn't know is I was following somebody else. Wow. I had gone to their churches. I'd seen the results. So when people said, we are so surprised, my goodness, it's working. I'm like, I'm not surprised. I saw it somewhere else. You see, this is the thing about following. is when you're following, you don't have to make the way. Somebody else has already made the way. So when you're walking and people are so shocked at how you're so smart, you're like, I'm not smart, I'm just following. Yeah, that should be your saying in life. If someone should make that t-shirt, I'm not smart, I'm just following. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not smart, but I'm just following. And so I, I followed these two guys. I did the things they did. I read their books. I went to their conferences. I met them. And the amazing thing is I saw the church grow the same way they had seen their churches grow. And this, I'm grateful to them for that season of my life. Without Bishop Titus Masika, I would not have known how to challenge people to become financially free and impact society. I mean, this guy, I, I mean, I know you've seen him at Fearless many times. You might not know how much he means to me as a person and how much he's impacted you as well. Because he's a man who began to show me Christianity has, cannot be contained to the walls of a church. We must impact society. And this is one man who's impacted his society greatly. And just by wanting to be like him and following him, I began to see things that I'd never seen before. Without Bishop uh, Doug Hayward Mills, I'd not know how to lead my people into a global movement. I longed for a long time. Our, vi our vision statement is about a global movement. Yeah, planting a church in every culture, a defining culture, defining church in every capital city of Africa and the gateway cities of the world by 2035. How long have we said that thing, guys? We've said it over and over since Mavuno started. Even when Pastor Angie was here, we used to say that. Yeah, it's not new. But you know, it's happening today. Hey. It wasn't happening back then. It's happening today. Why is it happening? Because I found someone called Bishop Doug Hedward Mills who's done it. And just by following him, boom, doors are opening. I'm finding things that were so hard, now they're so simple. Do you know why we're sitting here in a gathering today? Bishop Doug does it. 
I've learned from him. Wow. Guys, originality is overrated. Yeah. <laughs> Don't let anybody tell you any different. You cannot be your own father. It's not possible. It's not possible. It's not possible. You cannot lead yourself into greatness. It's not possible. It's not possible. Yeah, you need people ahead of you. God works through fathers to lift the curse and release the blessing. Somebody shout, I'm understanding. Yeah, this is it. This is why you're here. You need to understand this thing and align to it. Somebody told me another day, what about Matthew 23 verse 9? It says, Jesus says, and don't call anyone on earth father for you have one father and he's in heaven. And I say, that's a, that's a fair question because Jesus himself seems to say, don't call anyone father. What do you say about that, Pastor? I and mean, here's what I say to them. I said, you need to always read what you read in scripture in context. And scripture always supports scripture. Everything Jesus says that has become a rule for his church is something that you find supported almost since the Old Testament. That's the only time anyone in scripture ever says that. So you have to ask yourself, if Jesus said it only once and nobody ever repeated it, Paul never repeated it, Peter never repeated it, John never repeated it, why did Jesus say it? Then what you say is, what is the context? Why was Jesus speaking to the people at that time? Who was Jesus speaking to? He was speaking to the Pharisees. And why was he speaking to them? Because the Pharisees liked every title. They liked being called all the titles. They liked sitting in places of honor. They liked elevating themselves. And so Jesus is speaking directly to that situation. And he rebukes them for seeking those positions. But it's interesting because when you read Jesus himself, many times he actually uses the title Father. And he, he seems like he takes it for granted. He talks about the Pharisees who are telling people not to honor their father and mother because they've honored God. Why would Jesus say that if you're not supposed to call anyone on earth father? I mean, he assumed that people call their fathers father. He referenced Father Abraham. He talked about uh, this man who was in the bosom of Father Abraham, uh, Lazarus. Uh, and if you read, he talks about the, the commandment that says, honor your father and your mother. Jesus wouldn't say that if you're not supposed to call anyone father except your heavenly father. So you have to say, okay, let's read this in context because the title Father is obviously used many times. In the New Testament, Paul himself says, I became a father to you when I preached the gospel to you. He wouldn't say that if that's what Jesus was trying to insinuate. And I can give you many other references that show you the title Father applied to others except God. So there's clearly more. In fact, when Bishop Doug speaks about this passage, what he says is that no one person can serve as your father for all of your life. That's what Bishop Doug says. And I actually seem to think, yeah, there seems to be some reason there. Pastor Kelonzi talked about that God will bring different fathers in your life that will teach you different things. And that your biological father does not have everything you need for your spiritual purpose on earth. He will give you some certain things, but you must get other things to move to the next level. And so no, no one person can serve this role for all of eternity for you. Now, it's interesting because I want to just uh, talk about the types of father. And Pastor Kelonzi, again, you talked about this. Uh, I just loved how we are connected. And I want to sort of break down a bit of what he was talking about. Uh, we all have different types of fathers. And that's why I'm saying not one person can play that role. There is one supreme father that all of us have. He's the one from whom all fatherhood emanates. He's the one without whom there would be no such thing as a father. And that's your heavenly father. Your heavenly father is your first father. In the Old Testament, God is referred to as the father of Israel. Have you ever noticed? People in the Old Testament don't say, my father God. None of the prophets refer to God as their father. You've never noticed that. The Old Testament only mentions God as a father of the nation of Israel. But nobody in the Old Testament ever referred to God as my father. And that's why they were so shocked when Jesus came on earth and he kept saying, I only do what my father does. And the Bible says they were offended at him because he was making himself equal to God. Wow. They were like, nobody can call God Father. God is unapproachable. You can't bring yourself to that level. So Jesus is the one who brought a new revelation. And he says, when you pray, pray thus, our Father who art in heaven. He's bringing a new level of revelation. And he teaches his disciples to do the same. No wonder the Pharisees were just running around mad. Like, how dare you? Now you're even teaching your people to pray and say, Our Father, because the Jews would not pray in that way. Jesus was revealing this very powerful truth that we have a heavenly Father. God wants to relate to us primarily as a Father. 
That's the primary way he wants us to see him. When Jesus talked to God, he, look at all his prayers. He said, my father, take this cup away from me. He always referred to God first as father. Guess what, guys? God wants you to know him as father. And those things that have kept you from understanding how a father operates because you had a, an absent father, because your father ran away, because you never knew who your father was, you were brought up uh, with a place where there was no father, your mother had to be father and mother. It can be very confusing because you don't have a frame of reference. I've noticed people in that situation struggle. They struggle with fatherhood because nobody ever taught them how to even have a relationship with a father. But I want to say this, God actually, very specially for you who is in that situation, God wants you to learn how to be his son and for him to be your father this year. This is how you're going to grow spiritually fit. That you will actually get to the place where you spontaneously, through your spirit, through the prompting of the Holy Spirit, you say, Abba, Father. Hey. Abba, Father is not even Father, it's Daddy. Yeah. By the way, I used to call God very formally, my father. Nowadays, I call him Dad, Daddy, Papa. Because that's how God wants us to know him. He wants us to enter that level of relationship with him. He is our father. John 1, 12, yet to all who did receive him, those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. By the way, if you don't know Jesus as your savior, he's not your father. He's not your father. He's your maker, but he's not your father. You know that song we sing? I have a maker. He formed my heart. That song can, that part can be sung by everybody who lives on this, on this planet. But verse 2 can only be sung by those who have asked Jesus into their life and have become sons, have the right. And they say, I have a father. He calls me his own. And then what does it say? He'll never leave me no matter where. I go, I love those two verses, by the way, because the first one talks about our common human experience of a maker. He formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in his hands. That's true for everybody. That fits everybody in the earth. But when we cross over to verse 2, only sons can really sing this song and understand what it's saying. Because these ones are saying, I have a relationship with my father. The one who formed, he's not, he didn't just form my heart, he calls me his own. I belong to him. That's a place of belonging. That's our heavenly father. He's the one who knew you before your, heavenly, your earthly father even got any ideas about you. Yeah, he's the one who knew you. Pastor Robert Morris of Gateway Church, he teaches a very powerful truth. He says, your body came from the ground, is sustained by the ground, and will return to the ground. Think about that. We are made of two parts. There's a body and there's a spirit. God made the body from the clay. And then he breathed the spirit into it. So your body, it comes from the ground. It is sustained. What are the things that sustain your body? Yeah, it's chips, it's rice. All those things. By the your body right now, the way it looks like, it is just sustained by that. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, right now, it's like everything that you're seeing in that body has been put there by the, the ground. The earth has put everything we're seeing. Pastor Rush, I'm just seeing the ground right now. It may be ground that's shaped like ugali, it was shaped like chips, it was shaped like whatever it is you ate, it came from the ground. And he's well grounded. <laughs> Is it grounded or rounded? <laughs> but ultimately, that body, it will return where? The to the ground. That's exactly it. As believers, we know that. When we go to a funeral, what we are putting in the ground is not the person. That is the body. The thing that came from the ground has gone back where it belongs. But Robert Morris also says a very powerful thing. Pastor Robert says, your spirit came from God is sustained by God and will return to God. So think about it. This is why we fast. Because when you fast, you're telling the body, you're separating your spirit and your body. You're saying to the body, relax. 
because we shall be sustained by the real thing now. You know, sometimes the body can sustain you until you forget that you need spiritual sustenance. So what you're doing, you suspend the physical and you now feed on the spiritual. And let me tell you, when you begin to understand that about fasting, fasting becomes a joyful experience. Part of the reason we struggle with fasting is because our bodies are still demanding what sustains them. And when you get to the place where you understand that your spirit has control over your body, and long after your body is in the ground, your spirit will be alive with its maker, with its father in heaven. At that point, you begin to understand, my goodness, this is who I was made to be. My spirit is strong. Some of you have very muscular spirits. Some of us, our spirits are very underfed. Isn't that interesting? When you, when you don't fast, your spirit is underfed <laughs> and your body is overfed. And this is how we begin to understand, my goodness, I'm sustained by spirit. And many times the problem that we have as human beings, we don't get this, so we start trying to sustain spiritual problems with physical solutions, things of the ground. You're trying to sustain your spirit with things from the ground. What are things from the ground? Maybe you're depressed, so you take alcohol. It can't solve your problem. That's a physical thing, a thing of the ground, trying to solve a problem of the spirit. There's something spiritual that needs to happen, and you're putting the wrong solution into it. And you know, the thing about um, the spirit is the day you die, you go up. Have you ever, my wife likes these things we call, she calls them NDE, NDE videos. Does anybody know what NDE stands for? Near death experience. You also watch them, eh? <laughs> Near death experience. So my wife, I don't know, she just has this fascination. When she's relaxing, that's what she watches. Like, <laughs> Like, I don't know how that relaxes anyone, but she, she likes watching these shows that, I don't know if you've ever heard of people like Sid Roth and other people who talk about very supernatural things. And you know, it's so interesting when people are talking about how they were dying on, the, on that operation room. They always have that experience that they went up. It's like you, you, you are being operated, then all of a sudden you just found, whew, you're looking at yourself, you're looking at all the surgeons, you're in the room, and you can see all of them. And guess what happens? At that point, you really become yourself. That's who you really are. It's like it gives you perspective. And many people, by the way, when they come back from those kinds of experiences and God allows them to come back to their bodies, they change completely. They're never the same. Try and Google some NDEs and you'll see. Many people come back and they're like, I want to serve God with all my life. I want to give him my all. For the first time, they've understood the nature of ultimate reality. Pastor Jack, you almost had an NDE yourself. This woman has changed. She came back from near-death experience. How many days were you in ICU? 72, 72 days. The fact that she's, she's sitting in this seat is a sign that her days are not over. That God still has work for her. Yeah. Yeah. God has a lot of work for this woman. She's going to do amazing things. There's, no re there's a reason why God stopped you when you were young and pulled you out and put you back. Because he knew, my goodness, if I leave this one, she's going to waste this time that I've given her. It's a precious time. Watch this woman and see what God's going to do through her. Yeah, yeah. But you don't need an NDE, by the way, to tell you. <laughs> don't wait for it to happen. Serve God with what you have. Amen. So our spirits, this, this, this is the thing. We have a, a father of our spirit. And all other fatherhood, everything we're putting in here, we never lose the context. It is our heavenly father. The, the other fathers that are in our life are because the heavenly father allows them to reveal himself. That's what happens. The second father, of course, is your biological father. This is the one who, along with your mother, was involved in your conception. May have been a present father, may have been a caring father, may have been a providing father, or he may have been an absent father. Maybe you never ever even got to meet him. Either way, he's the one who caused you to be. Regardless of who he was, God has put in every section of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, beginning and the end, honor your father and your mother. It's like this one is one of those where you cannot say it's Old Testament, you cannot say it's New Testament. Everybody, Jesus himself rephrases it, commands it. Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you. Our biological father gives us a window into the fatherhood of God. It's interesting, Hebrews 12, 9 says, Moreover, we all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? Now, media, I know I, you may not have graphics, but I hope you have somebody there who can find a scripture when I read it. Do you have somebody sharp? It's there. Excellent. Yeah. Furthermore, we've all had human fathers who corrected us. We paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? God is the Father of spirits who allows us to have biological fathers. 
You know, without them, we don't know what a father is. Without them, we would not exist. And you know, some of you, God has revealed himself through your father in your father's absence. Because you may be at this place where you think, I don't relate. I don't understand because I didn't have that kind of father. So I'm not one of those who can say we all had. We had human. I didn't have a human father. But guess what? Because of that lack, lack you've always had a longing. You've always had a longing. So God revealed himself to you, not through the presence, but through the lack of. And I suspect for you, that longing is going to drive you to God even harder than somebody who took it for granted. So God allows our fathers to be a window, sometimes a bad window, but it's a window that reflects who God is. It's, it's a window that allows us to see, a mirror that allows us to see our heavenly father, sometimes cloudily, sometimes clearly. But that's the role that they play. That's why we must honor them. You know, Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, I believe that those who hunger and thirst for fatherhood because they lacked it, the Bible says they will be filled. They will be filled. God will give you a father. God will provide that fatherhood for you that you did not find with your biological father. Pastor Kelonzi talked about father-in-law and some of you laughed. Father-in-law is a very important person, by the way. Extremely important. Uh, your father-in-law is also a portal for blessing for those of you who are married. Some of you have not had that experience with your father-in-law. You need to understand today is a day of revelation. Something is changing today. This person is a, a portal of blessing for you. Exodus 3.1 says, Now Moses was tending to the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, Exodus 3.1, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. It's because of Moses' father-in-law that he met God. He came to the mountain of God. The flocks of the father-in-law, as he, as he honored and looked after the flocks of his father-in-law, he found himself at the mountain of God. If not for Jethro, mountain would never, uh, the mountain would never have come to Moses. He'd have been sitting there waiting for the day his destiny comes. It would never have come. But because of that father-in-law, doors were opened for him that would never have been opened. And that's a person who saved his ministry. Remember later when he was about to burn out early as a young leader, and his father-in-law came. Moses, by that point, it doesn't seem like he had a father who was alive. His parents seemed to have passed away by that time. But his father-in-law played a father role in his life and said to him, it is not good. And told him, you must divide leaders. You must create levels of leaders. Create a government structure. And you'd have thought Moses knew this because he had been in government. He, had, he was in Egypt all those years. But it seemed like it was book knowledge. And it took a priest, it took a pastor, it took Jethro to come and tell him, it is not good what you're doing. And when he changed it, everything started to work. Fathers-in-law are important. You know, it's interesting. My father-in-law is the one who blessed us with the place we're living right now. I live in Karen, in the leafy suburbs. And, uh, and I know some of you are like, hey, Pastor M, you're so rich with Pastor Carol. But you know what? We didn't earn that place we live. We live in the suburbs, in the leafy suburbs. That land is so expensive. If you had asked me to buy it, I'd have said, why am I using this kind of money? It was given as an inheritance. And that's where we live now. We have built our house on it. Your father-in-law also is a portal of God's blessing to you. And so if you've not had a good relationship with your father-in-law, you need to change it. You need to be the one who calls out fatherhood. Some of you may have been in a place where you avoid your father-in-law. You stay away from them. It's time for you to start to bless them the same way you bless your father. Uh, some of you may not even have your own father, but your father-in-law is still alive. It's time for you to start calling them father. Call them out. Bless them. Take them on a gift. Stop playing victim. Because sometimes we play victim. That family I married into. You know what? You have power to change that situation. Yeah, your power. Through honor, you have power to change that situation. Take authority. Bless them. Honor them. See what God will do. So that's your father-in-law. Number three is your substitute father. Substitute father. This is a person who played the role of a father in your life when your father was absent or was not able for some reason to play his role. For example, if you're if you adopted, some of you have adopted parents, and those adopted parents are, are the parents that you look up to, you don't know other parents. And you know what? That is the substitute father that God in his grace allowed you to have. Uh, that's the grace that God gave you. For some of you, by the way, it's your mother who took that role because she's the one who just out of sacrifice, decided to be both a father and a mother to you. So you, when you think about father, you, you actually think of your mom. Because <laughs> she had to play both the role of a father and the role of a mother in your life. Bless the Lord for that substitute father. 
God has given such, um, I, I really believe God is going to grace and bless that mother so much for what she did. Some of you have mothers like those who are just such self-sacrificing people. And they became such a blessing to you. You would not be who you are today. They called out all the roles a father should have called out. They're the ones who did in your life. And guess what? God allowed them in that place, not just to play the role of a mother, but to step into the shoes of that father and to play that role as well. And that's a substitute mother as well. And you know, sometimes uh, it could have been an uncle, could have been a grandfather, could have been a teacher, somebody who came in and stepped in to pay your fees. That's actually what happened to my mom. My mom, uh, my, his, my, my grandfather, uh, who my brother is named after, got killed by the Mau Mau uh, in the war. And so my mother was, uh, my, 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 mother, my, my mother's mother remarried, but I think the family was really struggling and they were not able to look after her. And what happens in such situations sometimes is that the, little, the, the, the child who came into the marriage can find themselves really in a difficult place. Am I talking to somebody? And so my mom was in a difficult place. She was a sharp student, and yet she was going to drop out of school because she couldn't pay school fees. And a teacher, God bless his heart, a teacher adopted her and took her home, paid her school fees. <laughs> you know, I still tear at that because I wouldn't be here if not for that teacher. My brother wouldn't be here. We called him Guka Timothy. We were adopted into his line. This man was a believer because that family my mom had come from were not believers. So I was adopted into that line. This man loved God. He was part of the East African revival. Because of that, my mother entered a Christian family. And she met my dad who also became, who had become a believer. And because of that, I have a Christian heritage. Uka Timothy was a pastor. My dad is a pastor. I'm a third generation pastor because of a substitute father. Yeah. Substitute fathers can play an important role, an important role. And so if you have a father like this in your life, that uncle who paid your school fees, honor them. You wouldn't be who you are if not for them. You wouldn't be who that you are if not for them. And sometimes what happens when there are messes in our parents' relationship, we get, we get it twisted. We start resenting them for the mistakes they made. We start, uh, how, do, how, how dare he have treated my mom like that? How dare he have left us like that? I want to just say this. Be gracious to your parents. You don't know what caused that situation. You're not that smart. In the same situation, you might have done exactly the same thing they did. You just need to be humble, by the way. And to understand, you let parents be parents. By the way, when it comes to my parents, I am a child. Even though I'm past time, I don't enter those issues. <laughs> I don't enter their issues because I realize I'm too, I'm too young. I'm just a child. <laughs> those are not things I even want to know about. So when you find that they had issues and your mom struggled, yes, 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 all those things happened. But you have no clue what was really going on. You don't know the real story. You had one side of the story. You don't know the real story. And you don't know where if it was you in that situation, you'd have done the same thing. So be gracious to them. Release them for their mistakes. You be a child to them. It could save your own marriage, by the way, when you do this. Yeah. yeah. Some of that resentment will actually pull itself into your marriage. So releasing that parent could actually save you and your marriage. So I want to talk about a different type of father now. I've talked about your heavenly father. Now I've talked about uh, these fathers now, the, the, who are the, what, your biological father, father-in-law, father substitute father. All these have to do, the first, first one is our heavenly father. The next three have to do with our biological body, our flesh. The thing that is sustained by the earth comes from the earth. The next ones I want to talk about have to do with your spirit. Because God also puts fathers to help you in your spiritual life. The fifth one I want to talk about is your father in Christ father in Christ. This is the person who led you to Christ. Now, many of you, my, some of you may not remember that person. Maybe you got saved as a little child. Some of you have always been saved. <laughs> By the way, it was so funny because we were talking to our kids the other day and we're like, we told one of our kids, you got saved at four years old. And she was like, I did. <laughs> so I'm like, so what do you tell people, by the way? She's like, me, I've always been saved. <laughs> no, you haven't. You got saved at some point. She just didn't know her story. 
but it's but she said I rededicated my life later, so that's what I consider myself. She was like, yes, but you did actually give your life uh, when you're very young. Some of you, how many of you got saved as children? Let me just see show of hands. Yeah, quite a few of you. Praise, wow, many more than I thought. Praise God. To God be the glory for you. Some of you may, even it was a parent who led you. So your biological parent became your, your father in Christ as well. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing. Uh, many don't remember, but you know, this father in Christ is the one who opened the door for you into salvation. They cause, a father causes a thing. They, they conceive something. They're the ones who conceived you in the spirit. They're the ones whom allowed you, you to be born again as a spiritual being. If they had not told you about Jesus Christ, you would still be a child of the devil. You'd still be in the kingdom of the enemy. And so they deserve honor as well. The person who was my, spirit, my father in Christ is actually Reverend Matthews Marla. Uh, he's a pastor in the AIC church. He was a great youth teacher back in the day. And one day in a Christian camp when I'd gone to look at girls, I only went because I thought girls... And it's so funny because there's a certain age when that's all... Your mind is just messed up. You just... You, that's all you're thinking. It's like, where can I find girls? And so that's where I was told the camp had girls, so I went to this camp. And when my mind is just thinking about girls, the Lord used this man. He preached a sermon. And I found myself going forward to give my life to Jesus. That day I'll never forget because the day before one guy had given his life to Christ, a guy who was an infamous criminal, and I was so angry that guys like that can get saved. I was judging him and I was not even saved. And I, I couldn't sleep the whole night. And so the next day when the guy made the altar call, I don't know what happened to me. I think I'd just been so ranting at God. I just found myself going forward. Like, I was like, I guess if that guy got saved, I better get saved. And I thought the same thing would happen to me. You know, I thought that, like, because when he went, many other people came and people clapped. Like, you guy, I went, nobody came. <laughs> I went to the front. I looked around. I was the only guy in Word of Life camp who got saved that night. It was so embarrassing, by the way. So he prayed for me very specially because I was the only one. Laid his hands on my head and prayed for me. And the next time we met, I was leading Mavuno Church. Like he never, he had no idea when he was leading me to Christ that he was raising somebody who would become an apostle. Your, your, your father in Christ, they, they play an important role in your life. And I've subsequently gone back to him and, and, and said thank you. And I actually do intend to honor him a lot more uh, going forward because he played an important role in my life. Though, um, yeah, so you look out for your spiritual, your spiritual fathers. Don't take it for granted, by the way. Some of you are like those prodigal sons. You're given birth to in the spirit and you took off. You've never come and told the person, thank you. At the very least, I'll get them a, a, a card. If you're one of those people who don't believe in honoring with substance, do something. Let them, let them at least know their work was not in vain. I'm here because of you. It's important that you honor your father in Christ. Uh, number six is your spiritual father. Your spiritual father could be the same person, but not necessarily. They could be somebody else. It's a person who taught you the essentials of faith, the person who discipled you, the person who taught you about God, the person who gave you those fundamentals of the Christian faith, how to be, how to be a faithful Christian, how to read your scriptures, how to fast and pray, how to be faithful to your spouse, how to tithe and to save. This person who helped you grow in the spirit and trained you in spiritual things. Paul said to the people of the church of Corinth, you may have 10,000 instructors, but you've only one spiritual father. I became your father when I preached the gospel to you. I think in Paul's case, he was both their father in Christ and their spiritual father. For me, that person is uh, Bishop Oscar Murillo. I, I honor him as the person who God used to help me grow in my faith. I don't have as much interaction now as I did then. But my goodness, we, I mean, he just shaped me. He shaped me. I mean, I really give thanks to God for him. He helped me avoid many, many, many traps that catch people who are like I was. Wow. Like, honestly, if, I was, if not for him, I don't know where I'd be today. Wow. I think the world would have taken me. I'd have probably been those guys who get saved at 40 from being an alcoholic. And, and I started a church and I'd be here. But my goodness, I'd have so many horror stories and things I went through that, I, that were completely unnecessary. And so this man is the one who God used to disciple me. That's your father in Christ. Uh, uh, your, sorry, your spiritual father. Number seven, your father in ministry. Wow. Your father in ministry. This is the person who called you into ministry, into serving God. The person who saw you and saw something more in you and called it out and you answered to that call. This is the person who said, I see in you a discipleship group leader. 
Come on, Pastor Nyamu. Yeah, I can see you're a father in ministry. That's it. Call you out and say, I saw, and say you're, you're, too, you're too important to be mediocre in this church. I see you serving as the head of ushers. I see you serving in our camera crew. Come on, do something for the Lord. They called out something in you that would have just been left. You'd not have been serving God if not for them. And you know, it's interesting because for many people here, I'm their father in ministry. Yeah, there are people here who would not be in ministry. Pastor Mishu, where would you be? You'd be some rich politician. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Making money in some places and not changing the lives that you're changing in Bujumbura. Yeah, I called him out and I said, come, you need to serve God. Yeah, Pastor James, I'm his father in ministry. Pastor Dorcas, they would be very happy, comfortable people. Pastor James, his ambition was to be the president of Kenya. Yeah. And I told him, one day you will disciple the president of Kenya. Yeah. And it's still going to happen, Pastor James. Yeah, exactly. Pastor Milton. I mean, I called him into ministry. Yeah, absolutely. He would not be here if not for me calling him. Yes, amen. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I've played many roles in Pastor Milton's life. I mean, it's interesting because for all these individuals, Pastor Angie, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I've called them into that space. I'm their father in ministry. We all need that person. I remember when Pastor Oscar called me to be a pastor. What? Like, okay, some of you think you're shocked when you're called to be a pastor. I was the last guy. Like, if I had 150 career choices, you know, pastor would not even have been in that list. It was not the thing I ever wanted to see, do, be. Like, if you ask me, the best I could have been is, a, like, like, I wanted to support pastors. Anybody feeling me in this house? Because many of you have been there. Like, just allow me to support the pastor, you know? They'll preach. I'll just make the money and bring to church. They can do what they want to do for God. And then the man says, I want you to serve in church. I'm like, ah. I felt like a deer in the headlights. That was the biggest thing anyone had ever asked me until that point. Like, seriously? I mean, I'd passed my exams. I was going to do my master's degree. I was, going to, I was on my way to becoming the rich pharmacist that I'd always wanted to be. And then he says, I want you to serve in church. And of course, I told him, let me pray about it. Many of you, by the way, have told me, let me pray about it. Yeah. Where is Pastor CJ? Huh? Let me pray. Uh -huh. Pastor CJ, he told me that many years ago. Let me pray about it. He had no intention. No intention of praying. But look at him. He's here now. To God be the glory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the, in the fullness of time, you're here. And this is the right time for you to be here, Pastor CJ. I love you, man. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, somebody called you out. You were just minding your own business. You're a filmmaker making amazing films. Pastor Matrid and Pastor Godwin says, I see in you a pastor. I see in you a pastor. That's what a father in ministry does. By the way, all of you are pastors in this house. You've heard me say that many times, huh? And some of you still think I'm joking. Shock on you. When I'm visiting your church, <laughs> you can hear people are not even saying amen. They're just very weak response. Very weak response. You had, you had Pastor Nyamo's testimony here. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not in, it, I will be there. I'll be there. I'll be visiting your church and you'll be shocked. I bless God for you. So that's your father in ministry. And they give you the opportunity to become everything that God called you to be. They're the ones God uses to unlock doors for you that you could never have unlocked for yourself. That's an important person. Number nine, your church father. Your church father. Your church father is the person who caused your church to exist. The person who allowed that assembly that you meet in, that fellowship, that family, to, be, to come into being. Without him, that ministry would not be there. Today you had our Pastor Kilonzi talk about Pastor Kiama. If you go to Mavuno downtown, that's your church father. That's the person who caused that church to exist. You may not even have known him. You may not have been there in his time. But if you go to downtown, you are blessed because that person was there. You're actually an answer to their prayer. Pastor Kiamen Wamboi prayed, and that's why you're where you are today. So they're still to be honored. They have a role that they played that allows you to be there today. They're the ones who conceived that ministry. And we honor them. We honor them. Amen. I want to say past, uh, to the Mavuno Kigali team, uh, there's a lady called Pastor Karo Ekinu. Find that woman and honor her. Yeah, she is the intern who left this church and labored. And after that, Pastor Jerry took over. And if not for those saints, the church would not exist. 
But now there's an, a, a mighty church, an amazing group of people. By the way, these are the most talented people you guys have ever met. They're just amazing, amazing people. You go there and see what God is doing and the dreams they have and the churches they're going to plant. But there's a woman called Pastor Kara Aquino. And sometimes we forget to honor our fathers, our church fathers, but we need to. When you have an anniversary, call them in, celebrate them, give them a gift. Let them know that their work did not amount to nothing. Number nine is your movement father. That's your movement father. <laughs> so the, what's a movement father? They're the reason... Uh, <laughs> okay, okay, behave yourselves. They're, they're the reason why a movement of the gospel exists. They're the reason why a movement of the gospel exists, a movement of faith. Movements of faith, they define cultures, they define times. There are many fathers of faith that have caused us to be, exist today. There are many movement fathers. Some of you went to the Methodist church. There's a guy called John Wesley. And he's the one who God used to bring that. And anybody who's in a Methodist church today, they exist because somebody was used as an apostle to start that ministry. And many of you went to the Deliver Deliverance Church. There's a man called Joe Kyle, Dr. Joe Kyle. And he's still alive. And he's the reason many, many people, some people are here in this room. Anybody ever was part of a Deliverance Church? Let me just see show of hands. There are many of you. You may never have met that man, but he's the movement father that who, as a result of you are here today. Or maybe your parents uh, were, there to, were there as believers. God uses certain apost apostolic leaders to start movements of the gospel. And as a result, many, many people, many, many churches are impacted and influenced and started because of those people. Their de dedication leads to the widespread of innovations and breakthroughs. And when you embrace those fathers, you receive those global blessings. That's what movement fathers are about. So a hint, if you're part of, of Mavuno, I'm your movement father. <laughs> let me just help you. Maybe you're thinking and you're wondering, who's the movement father? Okay, let me just put that out there. <laughs> that's the role I play in your life. Uh, it may be one of the roles I play in your life. So that's a movement father. And then Pastor Kilonzi talked about the father of sin. The father of sin. And I, I'm glad he explained that one. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 15. Just put that up. Matthew 23, 15. It says, this is, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. And he says something about them that is really cutting. Jesus did not, he didn't mince his words, by the way. Matthew 23, 15. Whenever he spoke to the Pharisees, I think his disciples would cringe because he said things that would easily make him in trouble. Uh, but he did not mince his words when it came to the religious leaders. He had very harsh things to say. Have you lost Matthew? It's the first book of the, of the New Testament. Matthew, okay, thank you. He says, What to you, scribes and Pharisees? Hypocrites. For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. That's a convert. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you yourselves. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus, my, I mean, where is that tender Jesus that we read about? We, we were taught that blonde, nice guy who doesn't offend people. Uh, that Sunday school Jesus, he doesn't actually exist in the Bible. He was harsh when he found injustice and he found people who abused power like the Pharisees. But he says, you turn people to be like you and then you make them sons of hell. That's the father of sin that Pastor Kelonzi talked about. Some of you found that you struggled with, with addictions because somebody led you into that space. Somebody led you into a space where you got, you, you, you uh, disobeyed your parents and you did something you shouldn't have and you failed school because you hung out with the wrong crowd and they became your father of sin. And some of you have been in a place where you've struggled even till today because of fathers of sin in your life. Porn addiction, drug addiction, chain smoking. You see, the devil is a copycat. He knows these things we're talking about. He knows the importance of fathers. So what he does is he plants substitute fathers in your life who give birth to iniquity and sin as opposed to righteousness. And that's one of the things the devil is. He's a copycat. Takes you in the opposite direction. Somebody who enticed you to rebel against authority. Somebody who, who, told, who taught you to say, Who's so and, who does so-and-so think they are? Why would they think they can say what they want to say? Live your own life and you found yourself in that space. They can destroy your faith. But I love the blessing that Papa Kilo left us earlier and I repeat it. That is not your destiny in this house in Jesus' name. Because the effect of fathers of sin is broken in your life today in Jesus' name. 
you will no longer be under their influence. The devil likes hiding under darkness. But you know what the beautiful thing about light? You turn on the light. Have you ever noticed when the, it's dark, even mosquitoes feel very brave? Hey. Like they come like they're animals. <laughs> you just turn on the light. Pop! They're gone. And that's what Jesus is what does. It brings the light. Today, the light has come into your life. And the mosquitoes of the devil are gone from you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God works through fathers to lift the curse and release the blessing. Where have you missed the blessing because of failing to recognize a father? And which father is God calling you to honor and recognize in this season? I want to pray for us as I conclude this, this talk. You know, it's interesting because I sense as I pray... But I'd like to do something. I'm going to ask my executive pastors to just stand up. And I'll ask you to just take a step forward. If I come all the way forward and then turn and face. As I've been teaching this, it's not theory for some of you. You've been in a place of heart that was caused by fathers either fathers in sin or physical fathers. And they have really cut in your way. You've struggled to relate with your heavenly father. Father wounds have a way of just clouding our view of God. So yes, you've been faithful, but there's a lid even in your spiritual life, your prayer life. You fast, but you just feel like it's hard for you to break through and have a real intimate relationship with the father because you just never learned how to. Some of you have been in a place where you just did not have a physical father to teach you how to relate to a father. Some of you, by the way, it's a mother wound. So it's not just fathers who cause wounds. And because of that mother wound, you just found, you found yourself just unable to relate. So here's what I want us to do. I'm going to ask us to just get into a time of prayer. And I'd like to ask us to do something. I'd like to ask you today in this house, I want to just put this out there that the curse is broken. Some of you curses were even spoken over you by fathers and ancestors, spoken over your family tree and they've held you back and you've seen the impact of those and you've tried to get out. But I believe in this house, in this place of faith where the Holy Spirit is, where God's people are gathered together, that the curse will be broken. Today you're going to leave this place a completely different person. And so I want to do this even as we come into this place, I want us to sing the song, I Have a Father, Who Knows My Name. And even as we sing that song in worship, I'm going to invite us that if you need that place of just, I just need an embrace from a father. I need to be broken free from the things that have held me back. I just need a new start, a fresh start. We've come from 21 days. And as I'm starting this new season of my life, I just need that father. Jesus comes out of that. You know, the father's anointing over him says, this is my son whom I love in whom I'm well pleased. And I believe that there's a father's affirmation for somebody in the house. So here's the instruction, pastors. I don't even want you to spend, it's not a prayer time. We'll come to the prayer time later. This is a hug time. That's the instruction I got. You will just hug sons and daughters and just hug them and say, Welcome to the family. The curse is broken. Just speak, the curse is broken. And allow the Lord to just break that curse. Amen. So let's stand up right now. We want to sing this song, I Have a Father. And as people are coming up, we're just going to be praying and singing. But I know that there are some of you, the Lord has already spoken to. You need to just come up right now and just begin. Just come to one of those fathers who are standing up there and just receive a father's hug. Receive a mother's hug. And just come back to that place where that curse is broken. It's not going to affect your marriage anymore. It's not going to affect your life anymore. Your prayer life is not going to be affected anymore because you have a father who's in this house. Amen. He knows my name. He knows my name. He sees each tears Some of you may just be coming to that father to affirm them. Your spiritual mother saying, I'm affirming you as my spiritual father. He knows 
my name. broken right now in Jesus name Generational healing is happening right now in Jesus' name. Uh, God is at work right now. Physical healing is appearing. Our sons and daughters are being reconciled. The curse is being lifted. The hearts of sons are being drawn to their fathers. The hearts of fathers are being drawn to the sons. And the curse is being lifted. We thank you, Lord, because only you can do this. You're a father who never leaves us. You're an amazing father. You love it when your children come back home to you. You're a father who dispenses nothing but good things. Hey, I speak over some of you. There's somebody here who never had a father. I'm saying over you right now, that awkwardness is gone out of your life in Jesus' name. You will never walk again and say, I have no father. Yes, you have a father. Not just the one in heaven, but you have a father here on earth. And you belong. You have a family. You have a birthright. You have an inheritance. You have an inheritance, somebody. And I speak over you that you're going to walk with your head tall from today. Something has been lifted. The barriers have gone. The curse has been lifted. You're walking out of this place as servants of the Most High God. Every virtue of this ministry is in your life going forward in Jesus' name. All the things that God has done in this church are yours. Every blessing is yours. 
as you follow in this family. This is the kind of father you have. Come on, just worship him right now. Say thank you, Daddy. I'm so glad to be in your presence. I'm so glad to walk in boldness, to walk in power, to walk in authority, to walk in inheritance. We bless you, Jesus. You hear us when we call. You know our names. chain break every chain break every chain oh to break every chain break every chain break every chain there is power in the name of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, oh. to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up there's an army rising up oh. to break every chain 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 I hear the chains falling 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 There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every. 
every chain, to break every chain, 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 to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain. Bless the Lord. We're just a few more people waiting for their father hugs, mother hugs. Can you tell there's freedom in the house? Yeah, there's freedom. There's just something being dispelled. The unclean is leaving, the clean is coming in. God is just doing something that is supernatural in this place. It's not something forced, it's not something that can be contrived by human. Yeah, today is a day of miracles, by the way. It's a day of miracles, and it's just beginning. You know, as people are still coming for prayer, and, and pastors, just stay there, because I think we need to keep praying. I mean, just keep hugging the ones who are left. We don't, we cannot, there's space for everyone in this house. So if you have not received your hug, demand it. It is yours by right. It's your inheritance by right. But I just wonder if there's somebody who is here who's not given your life to Jesus. You know, it's interesting, we're talking about Heavenly Father. But the word I say is so powerful. Sons call out fathers. It's so crazy that God Himself, who has the power to force us to be His sons, He says, yet to those who believed Him, those who received Him, those who believed in His name, those are the ones who He gave the right to become the sons. That God, He initiated it, but then He left it. Just like the son of the prodigal, uh, of the, the father of the prodigal son, he just waited at the gate. Because fathers are helpless when it comes to calling out sons. I can call you my son and try and hug you, but if you push me away, there's nothing I can do. As an adult, you have every, and that's how God created us. So the father waits for you, for the time you will say, I want to come to you. Some of you used to be sons and you walked away from your father, but today, in this place, you're saying, I understand why I need a father in my life. Some of you have never given your life to your father, but you're saying, today, I will give my life to this Jesus. I want to become a son of God. Let me just see if you're here. Just raise your hand wherever you are. Just raise it up real high. I see you at the back, my sister. To God be the glory for you. Anybody else? I see you, my, my brothers. I thank God for you. Anybody else? Just raise it up proud. Raise it up, raise it up, raise it up. Anybody else? I see you as well, the young man there. Praise God for you. Wow, 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 wow. The Bible says there's a party in heaven when one person makes that commitment. There's a party in Mavuno Church today. Because there are people who are saying, I want to know Jesus. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, don't let the devil, don't let the devil steal. Don't let the father of sin keep you away from what is yours by right. You are supposed to be a son of God. You are created to be a son of God. Just say, I will never be anything else. Just raise it up high. Anybody else? I want to make sure we pray for every single person who's saying I need prayer to accept Jesus today. Anybody else? I've seen at least three people. Anybody else? Before I pray for them, I don't want to shut the door. There's somebody who may be struggling with a thought right now that is like, I, I'm not sure this is the right time. I don't have what it takes. Listen, you don't qualify for inheritance. You just come back home. That's all it takes. God will sort you out. He's the one who will help you. He's the one who qualifies you. You don't qualify yourself. And so don't worry about that. All you need to say is I welcome you into my life. As you welcome him, he will come in and he will change you. Okay. Anybody, just raise your hand. I'm, I just don't know why I'm sensing a struggle right now. Sometimes in my spirit when I sense like I'm struggling, I know that somebody's struggling. Like God is showing me somebody's struggling. Maybe it's something you're in right now, the situation you're in that you know is going to cause so much to be undone. Maybe it's a relationship you're in and you know God is not pleased. And you're saying, God, I need to sort this out and make it right before I give my life to you. But you know, God is saying, don't worry about that. Let's get things right. Give your life to me first, and then I will sort you out. I'll even give you the wisdom to get out of the situation you're in. So if you're here, just put up your hand. This is your father who's calling you, not a pastor. I see you at the back. Praise God for you. Thank you so much. I see you as well, young man. Thank God for you as well. Praise God. Our God is so good. I bless God. I'm going to ask you all who've raised your hands, we want to welcome you to the family. So let me just ask uh, for those who are needing hugs, for just a pause. Huh? 
because we want to be good elder brothers as the prodigals are coming home. Just give us a pause that we'll continue. But first, I want to get the sons who are away from the house first to come back into the house. So let me invite all of you who've raised your hand, just come up the front right now. Come up the front. Let's just appreciate them as they come up. Welcome those sons and daughters who are coming. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Woo! You can do better than that, Mavuno. Yes, yes, yes. Come, 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 come. Don't be afraid. Just come up, come up, come up, come up, come up. Come on, Mavuno, encourage them as they come. Woo! Woo, woo, woo. Amen, amen. Wow, wow, wow. What a great, oh, come on, there's more of them coming. To God be the glory. Don't be left behind. Don't be left behind. Don't be left behind. We're so glad you're here. Amen. Oh, wow, wow, wow. So, so excited to have you guys here. And I'm going to ask pastors if you could just round them. Like, let's, let's uh, just go around behind them and pray for them uh, as I lead them to Jesus. Can you see how you're surrounded by some powerful people behind you? Uh, who are here to support you, to help you to grow. You're not orphans spiritually anymore. You are sons and daughters of God. This is, about, this is what you're about to enter into right now. By the way, if you're not out there, don't, don't come. If, you're, if you need to come, just come, come, come. We still have room. There's room for you. So don't be left behind if you need to be here. Let's appreciate that young man as he's coming. Praise God. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Amen. 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 I thank God for you. So let me just encourage you. Oh, come on, there's one more. There's a lady there. Praise God. I was wondering how can there, how can there be only one daughter? There have to be other, other ladies as well. So thank you for coming up. We bless God for you. Amen. So I want to just encourage you. You're part, you've been, you're, you've been here. You've heard God's word. The Bible says that when you open your heart and you allow God to come in, that he comes in. It's not a joke. It's not just a word. God actually will come into your life. And from today on, he will become the leader of your life. He will take over. Where, where you've had struggles, debates, God will show you what to do. Because that's what he does to his sons and daughters. All you need to do is ask him, and he will do that. But as you ask him into your life, I want to just encourage you and tell you, this is the best day of your life. Amen, amen. Thank you for coming. It's the best thing you could... By the way, as I'm talking, don't feel it's too late. Just come and interrupt us. We're so happy to be interrupted if you need to be here. As you pray this prayer, you're going to, you're, I want to lead you so you make the prayer yourself. But as you pray these words, it's you asking your father, talking to your father, ask him to come and be your leader. And then watch what God will do. Amen? So I'm going to ask you to put out your hands like this. This is a gesture of surrender. It's saying, I surrender to you, God. And then just say these words after me. Can we, for those of you who know these words and have said them and you believe them, can we all say it together with them? So we'll accompany them. We're all going to say these words aloud. Dear Jesus, I come to you today to give you my life. Forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for trying to lead my own life. From today forward, I surrender to you. Come into my life. Be my Savior and my God. I will follow you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live the life that you created me for. In Jesus' name, amen. Woo! Praise God. Pastors, can you just greet them? Tell them welcome to the family on our behalf. Can you just shout welcome to the family? Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Let me ask all of you, just uh, follow Pastor Mina over there. Pastor Mina, if you could just wave. He's just going to pray for you and then take your names and we can send you some information later. He'll just take your phone numbers. He won't take long with you. So just uh, maybe one of the pastors can lead them that way. Pastor Kilon, Just follow Pastor Kilonzi. Let's appreciate them as they do that. Wow, 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 wow. To God be the glory. Thank you so much, pastors. Is God in the house? He's in the house. Let me just ask that even as we have lunch, 
Let's understand that even lunch is a sacred moment, by the way. Some of the prayers you've had over your 21 day fasting will be answered as you have lunch with each other. So don't look down on anyone you're having lunch with. Have those conversations. Listen to what they're saying. I believe God will give us words for each other. I want to encourage you because we're in a, a prophetic space. If God gives you a word for somebody as you're having lunch, don't be shy. Just tell them, by the way, this is what I sense God is saying. This, this is something I heard. And even if it's, you can even, if you're not even sure, you can say, by the way, I'm not even sure. But this is something I'm sensing for you. And just give them that word. Tell them, pray about it. And I believe that God will actually use us to minister to one another over these next four days. And so, come on, give your neighbor a high five. Tell them, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Let me invite our MC, uh, Pastor Kelvin, come up and just tell us what to do next.